Hey everyone and welcome to our third mini lecture on hallucinogenic drugs. This is Pharmacology of Hallucinogenic Drugs Part 2. So let's start off by talking a little bit about structure. Um, most hallucinogenic drugs have a serotonin-like or catecholamine-like structure. Serotonin-like or endolamine include LSD, psilocybin, psilocin, DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, and synthetic tryptamines. Whereas catecholamine-like include uh, mescaline and NBOMEs. Uh, amphetamine can produce hallucinations as well with high enough doses. So generally speaking, structurally, they're either like serotonin or they're like catecholamines with a few exceptions. So, word on receptor binding. Almost everything that we're talking about is mediated by 5-HT2A receptors. If you remember back to our uh, serotonin unit, we mentioned back then that a lot of hallucinogenic effects are mediated by uh, this receptor type. So LSD, for example, binds to the very high affinity to at least eight 5-HT receptor subtypes. Uh, Catecholamine-like uh, hallucinogens also bind to serotonin receptors. Both of these produce hallucinogenic effects via action at the 5-HT2A receptor. Uh, we know that piece of it uh, for sure, but as you'll see as we move on, there are a lot of things that we don't fully understand about hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, LSD is extremely potent, as if you remember from our discussion of uh, the doses necessary. Um, a lot of this has to do with its unique interaction with uh, the receptor, which I thought this was um, super cool. So when it binds, it forms a sort of a lid, the conformational change that takes place when the uh, LSD molecule binds with the uh, receptor protein. It causes a conformational change in that receptor protein that forms a sort of lid over the binding pocket, which traps the drug in place, meaning it continues to bind and exert its effect. Um, typically, drug molecules bind rather loosely and sort of bind and unbind uh, readily. Not the case with LSD, which remains sort of locked in place. So while most hallucinogenic drugs work via 5-HT2A receptors, some do not. For example, salvinorin A, uh, which we talked about earlier on, works uh, as a potent kappa opioid receptor agonist. So it's not producing its effect through 5-HT uh, receptors, making it uh, pretty distinct from the other classes of drug we've talked about. This accounts for some of the dissimilarities in the drug's subjective properties. Uh, so this drug genetically produces a different uh, subjective profile than the other hallucinogens. Though the hallucinatory mechanism for this drug is currently not completely understood. So let's take a little bit of a look at how exactly these uh, hallucinogens work. So in this diagram we have, oh, in this panel, uh, a brainstem 5-HT neuron, so a neuron with its cell body and the raphe nuclei, and it's projecting out and releasing serotonin into uh, deep layers of the cortex, as well as, in particular, uh, layer 5 of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's having this sort of excitatory effect via uh, 2A receptors. Um, so that's serving to increase the amount of glutamate that's released here in layer 5, um, exerting its effect on NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors. So something that we know is that hallucinogens disrupt the normal, normal rhythmic oscillations in the cerebral cortex. So we haven't talked a whole lot about um, neural oscillations in this course, but an oscillation is basically a, a rhythmic firing of a population of neurons. And typically it is indicative of communication between multiple brain regions. So uh, this rhythmic activity depends upon glutamatergic uh, cortical network. So this glutamate input coming from other sites in the cortex. And a disruption of this sort of system accounts for some of the consciousness altering effects. So at base, we have this system where we have serotonin signaling uh, happening here, influencing uh, cortical layers that are going to be part of this oscillatory network. So they're going to be releasing glutamate onto uh, prefrontal neurons, um, as well as we have serotonergic input here under this deep cortical layer, as well as to the prefrontal cortex itself. And since hallucinogenic uh, drugs work on 2A receptors, which are present not only here in the cortex, as well as here in the prefrontal cortex, so they're going to be disrupting um, normal activity in these regions, which is going to disrupt the glutamate signaling, which is necessary for that regular rhythmic activity. So I know it's kind of a, an unsatisfyingly vague description of how does a drug produce a uh, psychological disruption in hallucinations, but sort of the best explanation that I can give is that um, this rhythmic state is normal, is necessary for normal conscious behavior, and hallucinogenic drugs alter that rhythm. 
So let's talk a little bit about hallucinogen abuse. Uh, there's not really high abuse potential with hallucinogenic drugs. You just don't see a lot of it. Uh, there's no withdrawal symptoms. So using this drug and then abruptly stopping doesn't cause any ill effects. It's not an effective reinforcer. So rats and mice really don't work to self-administer it. Uh, it's not really innately reinforcing. Uh, in that it doesn't sort of act through that rote um, mesolimbic dopamine system that we've talked about in some in pretty much every other unit. It's not strongly reinforcing. Uh, dependence is unlikely, though it does occur in a small number of users, especially if they are exposed in early age. There does exist in DSM-5 this um, diagnosis of other hallucinogen use disorder, which most of the drugs we're talking about uh, today, if you were to become dependent on those, it would fall under that category. But yeah, unlike most of the drugs that we've talked about, there is little abuse potential, um, no withdrawal, and it's not a reinforcer. Uh, so you might be wondering, why is this considered a Schedule One substance? I don't really have a great answer for that. It probably shouldn't be. Uh, so speaking a little bit about tolerance, tolerance does uh, develop rapidly to most things we've talked about. Uh, DMT and 7-RNA do not produce rapid tolerance to repeated use, but the others do. Uh, the mechanism that is most likely at play here is downregulation of the 2A receptors. Uh, and in fact, this has been demonstrated in, uh, in a rat model. So overuse or chronic use of hallucinogens can produce a downregulation or a decrease in the amount of uh, serotonin 2A receptors that are available. So what are some issues that can um, come along with hallucinogen use? Well, uh, as you have probably heard about, you can have a bad trip, which could mean you're uh, having a hallucinogenic experience covered, accompanied by acute anxiety or panic. Uh, this is related or can be related to the individual's emotional state, environment, or individual personality factors. So if you're in an unsafe environment or um, you are sort of stressed out or in a bad state when you when you try to use this, you might end up having a very bad time. Um, flashbacks can be produced by certain hallucinogens, so people can re-experience hallucinations even after drug use has stopped. Uh, typically, this is uh, more intermittent, but in certain cases, this can occur for a long time and be considered um, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, or HPPD, which causes those afflicted with it uh, distress and uh, life impairment. A psychotic reaction is possible, um, but with few exceptions, prolonged episodes only occur in individuals who are already diagnosed with a psychotic disorder or who have a pre existing risk for developing psychosis. So for those who already have um, <clears throat> psychiatric disorders or psychotic disorders rather and or have a risk for developing psychosis, probably want to stay away from this. So uh, this class in BOMES are the most dangerous. Um, this newer class that is much more potent than many other types. Uh, people using this may suffer from delusions, severe agitation, and aggressive behavior, seizures, tachycardia, hypertension, extreme hyperthermia, and uh, muscle breakdown, as well as kidney damage. Uh, so this is the, the most risky of the uh, examples we've talked about today. So as I sort of hinted at earlier, there's a renewed interest in the use of hallucinogenic drugs as therapeutic adjuncts for a, a number of different things. Um, so without uh, going into extreme detail about this, the important component of the therapeutic process is thought to be the peak experience or the portion of uh, the drug experience where the uh, psychoactive effects reach their peak. Um, the elements that are part of this part of the drug experience include a sense of unity and oneness, transcendence of time and space, positive mood, um, sense of reverence and wonder, etc. sort of opening up of the person, which can make them more amenable to traditional psychotherapy. Uh, this afterglow period can last from days to weeks, followed by a long-term stage of residual effects on the patient's mood and cognitive set. So some initial evidence sets that this, uh, suggests this could be a, a useful adjunct to standard talk therapy. And the greatest likelihood of success is, is associated with uh, an intense peak experience. So uh, this method might hold some, some real potential for people in certain situations. Uh, I know this can be especially effective for people who are facing sort of an end-of-life diagnosis. Um, the use of hallucinogens can, can help people cope with the, uh, the inevitability of a rapidly approaching death. Uh, in addition to this, there's uh, some initial work being done looking at uh, psychedelic drugs or drugs that work on serotonergic receptors as a, um, a means of facilitating uh, addiction therapy.
Okay, so that is it for our part two discussion of the pharmacology of hallucinogens. We'll see you next time.